everybody. Uh, welcome to another one of these. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more intimate today, and I'm just trying to juggle my wine. There we go. You got nervous there, right? I was going to take it. Okay. All right. So the way this works, we have a mini and a full-length talk. If you want to give a mini, let me know, because I'm filling out uh, the rest of the year. I've already tried to bully some of you. Uh, uh, so uh, there's also a Slack channel. So if you want to see what's coming up, uh, you can volunteer, or I can volunteer you in the Slack channel as well, so it's much more convenient for me. But we're going to get started. So I introduce both speakers, and uh, there's something true, and then there's something not true about them, so let's get started. Kieran loves making things, whether tinkering with circuits, writing software systems, or sewing dresses. She works on Stripe's infrastructure team and has previously built things for the New York Times, LinkedIn, and MIT CSAIL. CSAIL. Uh, Kieran is the author of a beloved children book series based on her pet goldfish named Philip. Let's give it up for Kieran. So I'll be talking about Hyperloglog, and this is Papers We Love San Francisco. Uh, my name is Kieran, and I've got an intro. I love hearing about the history of technology, so if you have any good stories, let me know after this. I collect them. Um, so this is a story of an algorithm I stumbled upon a couple of years ago and found really magical. It's part of a set of data structures called sketching data structures. So I'll start by covering the background, what the cardinality problem is, and what the traditional means of solving it are. Then I'll dig into the paper, um, building intuition for the solution before digging into the algorithm itself. And finally, we'll discuss some work that came after this, where I've seen this algorithm pop up in production systems and um, further improvement upon it. As a note, these little icons will be at the bottom right of my slide so you can tell what section I'm in. Matters less for a short talk, but hey. Um, so the background, we'll talk about what the cardinality problem is and introduce estimation. So the cardinality of a collection is the number of unique elements in it. This set of shapes has a cardinality of three. There is a circle, a star, and a diamond in here. Um, so measuring cardinality can be useful in a number of other ways. In natural language processing, understanding the number of unique words Shakespeare uses in his works tells you something about his vocabulary. Um, with traffic modeling, a low number of unique IP addresses generating all the traffic you might be seeing could be indicative of a denial of service attack. So a simple way to measure cardinality is to initialize a bitmap of the number of unique values you might be seeing and just mark the buckets as the values come in. If there are n possible values uh, number it could be, you initialize a bitmap of size n. So it's proportional to the, number, to the cardinality. So for IPv4 addresses, you'd see 2 to the 32. Um, you initialize a bitmap of 2 to the 32 bits, which is about half a gigabyte. It's a lot, it's a lot, of, um, it's a lot of memory to put on your heap. So you often have too much data to study in depth, but you want to get some big, broad sketches of it. Like the approximate number of IP addresses is important, not that you have like 2,334. Um, 2, 334. And this is where this paper comes in. So this paper, Hyperloglog, builds on some previous work by the authors to propose a fairly efficient data structure for estimating cardinality. This paper is 10 years old this year, so it seemed like a good time to revisit it. Um, the main author, Flagellet, also passed away a couple of years ago, so it's a com commemoration of his work. Um, so a quick overview of the efficiency accuracy trade-off this algorithm makes. If you have n max possible values, this takes about log log of n max space, and thus the name of the algorithm, um, with the error inversely proportional to the square root of space taken. So putting this into real numbers, for a data set with a billion unique values like our IPv4 problem, it requires about half a, one and a half kilobytes of space and would have an error somewhere around 2%. Um, backing up, let's build out the intuition for how this algorithm works a bit. I don't know how many of you remember these vending machines, but they spit out tiny capsules of toys with Pokemon in them. Some are more likely than others to show up. There are a ton of Squirtles and Bulbasaurs, but way less Charmanders and Pikachus. So let's say that I have a large group of my friends playing this game, and you want to figure out about how many friends I have. Um, and I tell you that one of them got two Pikachus in a row. Since it's a fairly rare Pokemon, and it's fairly rare that you see two in a row, you know that I have about 64 friends playing this game, because I was pretty popular in elementary school. Um, so again, um, reiterating that, seeing a rare combination means that it's pretty likely that I've seen a lot of trials. You can extend this to bit patterns. If you have a bunch of uniformly distributed binary numbers, to have seen a number that's fairly rare, you've probably seen a lot of numbers. So if you see a run of three zeros at the beginning of the number, you've probably seen about eight numbers. 
if you're familiar with the Bitcoin proof of work algorithm, this isn't that um, dissimilar to the same idea there. So we can turn our distribution of random values into a, or a distribution of values into a uniform distribution of binary numbers by hashing them. Hashes are great. They turn a bunch of values into uniformly distributed numbers, which is exactly what we want. Um, an example hash is murmur hash that a lot of HLL algorithms use. Um, but like the Pokemon example, there's a potential for an enormous amount of variance with this technique. It's entirely possible, though unlikely, that I have only one friend, and that one friend got two Pikachus in a row. Um, so to increase the accuracy, a common thing, a common statistical technique is to repeat the experiment several times over. So you'd want my group of friends to play the vending machine several times, getting several independent experiments. Another possibility is to split them up and have a, have a different set of friends play a different set of vending machines and average out the probabilities there. So if you've evenly distributed my friends over three different vending machines, you can take the average of what you'd estimate from each one. So um, playing the Pokemon machine, you'd think I have about eight friends playing that one, four friends playing the sticker machine, and five friends getting plastic rings out of things. So that ends up being an average of um, five friends per thing, and multiplying them all by the number of streams you've split them into, that gives you 15 friends total. Still with me? Great. So now that we've built out like some terrible analogies to compare it, um, the actual algorithm, you initialize a register of m, um, of m bytes. So here there are eight bytes and eight buckets you could split things into. So given a number from the stream, you grab the first log of eight bytes, so the first three byte, um, the first three bits, and select a bucket within my bit vector. So you bucket the first three bits. So you pick 0, 1, 0 on my vector. Um, then you count the number of leading zeros in the rest of the number and then put that number into that bucket. So repeating this with a bunch more numbers, you do the same thing with the bucketing, and you get this stream of counted zeros and ones. Then similar to, um, this is similar to how you split a bunch of my friends over different vending machines. You split them into different buckets. Since they're uniformly distributed, the number of unique values you see per bucket corresponds to approximately one eighth of the total number of unique values you'd see. Hashing, it's magic. Um, so you now take the harmonic mean of all of these, because the harmonic mean is really good at throwing out extra large values, which is um, one of the main con differences between the hyperloglog algorithm presented in this paper and the log log that came before this. Um, so with the numbers I decided to run through this, I got about 31.5 unique values. And I used like 28, so it wasn't that far off. Um, this algorithm's fairly incorrect at very small cardinality values. It's actually kind of magical that I got the number that close with that many buckets. Um, I got lucky. So for example, here, um, let's say I'm only running through a small number of values, and these are the numbers that I've seen. A majority of my registers are still uninitialized because I've bucketed it far too wide. Um, there's another probability problem here that you can use to make up for the um, small value corrections. So you can, um, it's called, you think, you can think about throwing balls into bins randomly. So here you see five empty bins out of eight. So it's likely that I've thrown about three to four balls into bins to have seen um, only three bins filled out of these eight. And this is the algorithm you can use to fill out that bit. Um, this is also, this algorithm is also very um, biased at very large values. So as the number of unique values approaches a very large number, you start seeing hash collisions. Makes sense. Um, to make up for this, you can do some amount of bias correction, but it actually mostly makes more sense to use a larger hash and use more bits in the registers, so you can count more zeros out and have less collisions. So, um, so far we've been talking about the algorithm, the paper itself. Uh, this is a good point to move on to where I've seen this being used. So there was a follow-up paper in 2013 written by Google that talks about what they use to bring, um, to count the number of unique Google searches that they're seeing. Um, they expanded the number of the hashes from 32-bit hashes to 64-bit hashes and had both bias counting and the linear counting algorithm at small ranges to make up for it. They also took their very sparse um, vector and compressed it fairly heavily, so they saw much better, um, much better results at smaller cardinality values. Um, at Stripe, where I first ran into it, we use it in a couple of different places. 
So a lot of our transaction modeling algorithms use this as, a, um, as an input to their features. So things like, you might want to like collect information on number of unique cards a merchant has seen, how many IP addresses the card has been used on, um, how many zip codes a card has been used from, which tells you something about how likely the card has, is to have been compromised. You can also use it to see how many, um, how many zip codes a card has been used from in the last month, which is another algorithm called HLL series. Um, on the observability team, which I work on now, we use it for counting um, the number of unique merchants that um, may have seen a particular error, which tells us something about how distributed an error might be across our entire fleet. Um, so using the statistical properties of a distribution of numbers is a really powerful way to operate over very, very large data sets where it's impossible to actually go through the entire thing. There are a couple of other fun probabilistic structures that I've started poking into, and my reading list is very long now. Um, we also use Q-digest and T-digest on the observability team for aggregating and estimating large metric um, distributions so you can get the percentile values of over like a billion sets very quickly and parallelize it very neatly. Um, you can get a frequency table of the number of errors someone may have seen and a few other different things. They're fun. Well, that's all I have. We also have time for questions. Anybody has questions? So you talk about the uh, hyperlog uh, series. Um, I don't know what, what do you know about it. It seems like very interesting. It seems like uh, it could be optimized. Uh, like it could be uh, optimized. I don't know. I agree. Um, I have not read that much into it. I've used it in production, but I haven't read the paper yet. I would imagine you do some sort of bucketing sliding algorithm. Yeah. You like collect days and just count the last 30 days of things. But I'm not positive. I have no idea. Any other questions? Yeah, I heard about that one today when I was talking to someone. Sorry? It's going to be loud, but I just oh. need to do it. Thanks, Kieran. Um, what are the trade-offs between space and like accuracy for hyperlog log? Um, it's the number of separate experiments or bins you hold. So the more streams you split it into, the lower you can get your... Sorry, I'm not talking to my mic. The number of streams you split it into, the lower you can get your variance, because it's, it's inversely proportional to the number of separate experiments you're running if that makes sense. Yeah. Any questions? If you don't have questions, while well, the next speaker sets up, there's more, uh, there's beers on that, like in that cooler that were from upstairs. So we ended up inheriting beers and there's pizzas and the restrooms are outside. Okay, so thank you, Kieran. <laughs> All right, let me introduce our, uh, our main speaker. Ifan is a graduate student at UC Berkeley researching topics at the intersection of databases and human computer interaction, currently investigating asynchrony, asynchrony and consistency for interactive visualizations. She has given talks at conference workshops and Strange Loop. She has hitchhiked across Iceland. And she also plays a trumpet in a mariachi band called Los Estudiantes. There was supposed to be one thing that's uh, not correct. And uh, I think the point is not to tell people which one it is. Uh, not sure if it makes it more entertaining, but uh, all right, here goes the talk. Um, So again, as introduced, I'm Ifan and I'm a grad student at Berkeley. If you're interested in what uh, academia is like, you're more than welcome to talk to me and or if you're interested in any of the research areas. With that being said, uh, the paper that we're going to be reading together today is uh, called Reactive Vega. Uh, to sort of dissect the title a little bit, there's uh, quite a few buzzwords going on here. So first we see uh, reactive, which is a uh, pioneered by the recent trend of uh, React, Rx, and uh, Elm, and all those good things, and uh, data flow, a streaming data flow nonetheless, uh, architecture for declarative interactive visualizations. So when I see these words, um, like data flow and reactivity, I just feel like people keep on re like re re referencing one thing with another and it's sort of recursive and I never really know what's going on. So hopefully uh, this talk, I will sort of ground us in like very concrete ideas and avoid these uh, fancy notions that we should sort of all be familiar with, but. Quite, can't quite pin down. 
And so the plan of attack is to first talk about Vega. Uh, we need to describe the language semantics, and uh, on top of that language semantic, how it's how the architecture is built to execute these uh, specifications. And afterwards, we will talk about uh, database ideas that are related to visualizations and front end. And I promise you, there are a lot of connections, and hopefully, it will be an interesting soup of ideas or uh, a wine tasting of systems ideas in the front end, if you will. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to uh, dive right into Vega. So uh, Vega is a, a very mature open source project uh, that they're releasing uh, version 3.0 and has gained quite a bit of traction on GitHub already. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, like this uh, visualization ecosystem, at least you should have heard of D3. Um, and uh, s some folks on the on the paper, specifically Professor here, actually advised uh, Mike Bostock to co-create D3 uh, a while ago. So, uh, and D3 is one of the few uh, JavaScript libraries that has not fallen into oblivion after a, a couple of years. So that's uh, definitely something to be said about it. And just sort of for reference, uh, how many of you are front-end engineers? And back end. Okay, great. And hopefully that the talk will be interesting. Well, the if you want to make it more relevant for you, a uh, uh, bonus points to sort of identifying pieces that you find relevant for uh, systems from these like front end components. All right. So this is. Uh, sort of the state of Vega as an open source project, but uh, the state of Vega in relation to other uh, visualization languages is that it's right at the middle of the sweet, sweet point between ease of use and expressiveness. What I mean by expressiveness is, uh, uh, sorry, what I mean by ease of use is uh, specifying visualizations using things like Excel or Google Charts that are super straightforward. And Vega and D3 fall into this uh, ease of use land because they have a declarative JSON specs, which we'll take a look at later. Uh, but at the same time, D3 and Vega are also very powerful at expressing a multitude of visualizations. And uh, here's sort of a, a gallery of things that you can create with Vega. And so how does uh, Vega differ from D3? Given that D3 is so amazing, why do we need yet another domain-specific language for JavaScript? Uh, not to say that there are many uh, new JavaScript libraries every day already being made. Um, so let's take a quick look at D3. Uh, so this is an example where we draw three points. And the most interesting thing, at least in my opinion here, that's going on is when you bind the circle uh, with the data. So here, there, this data binding creates a very declarative specification where you're essentially just prescribing to the visualization the most important components without like any additional specification that could sort of be done by the, the library for you already. Uh, we'll take a closer look at it later, but essentially here we see a bunch of data binding going on. So first we, we we specify the data it's going to be connected to and then gives a function that evaluates the, the position of x based on the value of the data and its radius. Cool. So th these three is all great. A lot of people use this. It's one of the most uh, starred uh, repos on GitHub. And how many of you have actually used it? OK, all right. So I'm basically do not need to do an explanation then. Uh, but when we come to interactions, and then this is an implementation of drag, it becomes slightly more imperative. And what I mean by imperative is that you now have to keep track of state. So for instance, this dragging thing is being used across these functions to detect what state your current interaction is sort of in. And once it starts composing with other interactions, it might get hairy and uh, it's not as uh, composable. And I'll give a very concrete uh, idea of what com com compositionality means for Vega later. It's definitely a lot more than this. So sort of the difficulty of implementing interactions within D3 motivated uh, the, this new design of the Vega eco ecosystem. And just to uh, take a look at what it would take to implement a, a bar chart in D3, which is like, again, very simple, and D3 is a very elegant domain specific language. We sort of have these like, data binding that's going on where we enter these uh, different uh, elements of the DOM based on uh, it's, it, the, the data that's bound to it. But 
we notice that this hover effect of uh, highlights is actually done via CSS. And one thing to note with Vega is that it can produce both canvas and SVG, and it can do server-side rendering, which means that a lot of the interactions it uses, like all of the interactions it does is independent of CSS. And if you don't have things like CSS, the interaction here becomes a lot more complicated, and you probably couldn't fit all the code uh, on this side. So. Uh, let's take a look at the Hello World, the, the bar chart with Hover and uh, the tooltip uh, implementation in Vega. And again, like this talk is sort of more about the architecture of Vega so that I can get to talk about the things I actually care about, well, which is uh, more on the system side, but uh, uh, it's important that we have a good grasp of uh, how it's actually implemented so that we can sort of reason about the different parts. Uh, so the specification overall looks, have the following components, is sort of a mouthful, but uh, uh, we'll walk through them uh, one by one, and it should make some intuitive sense. And there's like a vast amount of literature behind, uh, inter behind data visualization that sort of describes the grammar and composition. Like, has anyone heard of grammar of graphics? Uh, Okay, a few, a few. So uh, sort of this uh, design, although it sort of looks, I, I made it look a little bit dry, but it's actually sort of a development based on many years of uh, like visualization research that sort of encapsulated all these uh, higher level logic that's involved with uh, visualizations. But uh, let's sort of dive in. The first part is data. So in order to specify the data, you have the name, the values, you give the category, which is the on the bottom and the value, which corresponds to the y-axis here. And we have scales, uh, so the x scale is sort of categorical, and I think they called it band. And then the y scale is a linear, which I think is a default, so they didn't need to specify. And then quickly we start seeing that you start noticing these weird things associated with uh, high-level specifications. You're like, oh, what does this nice mean? Uh, I think if you use it more, like it will start becoming a little bit more intuitive. So nice here means like round values. So they will actually just like round it off instead of uh, trying to go for the exact values. And another caveat to mention is that Vega is not really supposed to be used by developer, your, the average developer. They, they, the team has built another very elegant language called uh, Vega Lite. So that's a lot more succinct. So uh, please don't criticize the language for verbosity. Uh, we're just sort of describing it so that I can sort of get into the architecture side. Um, the other piece that needs to be specified is axes. So the difference between scale and axes is that scale is an abstract idea. Scale is sort of the mapping between your data to the visual elements, whereas axes is, is literally the marks that you see. Um, and as you can guess, it's connected with the scale. Um, and there are some uh, underlying like connection that just renders axes correctly. Um, and they'll have signals. Uh, how many of you have very fond uh, opinions of signals or like, you know, the, the functional programming people? FRP folks in the room? Okay, wow. Uh, you, you don't have to be like afraid of identifying as a FRP person. We won't start asking you Monad questions. Uh, I, I, for one, don't really like, I'm not a programming language person, but so I'll just try to describe signals as I understand it from a, like a database perspective. And as hopefully I'll show, there's actually a lot of uh, deep connections. But uh, in like layman's words, which will probably offend a lot of uh, like deep PL people, uh, signals is essentially just change. Uh, let's just think of uh, this here as you have a mouse over this rectangle. And so that's a change, right? For, for the system, there's some state is now different. Um, and it has some updates, which will be consumed down the line, and we'll see. And then we have marks. So marks are sort of a visualization term which specifies the geom geometry that you see here. And this is specified to be a rectangle, and it's derived from this uh, source data that we defined previously. They have scales and uh, other attributes. And so here we see this weird thing called a hover. Uh, I think this is just sugar because hover is such a common uh, scenario. Like it can also be just implemented via signals. So like things that uh, have a mouse over on the rectangles. So cool. Uh, and then uh, because everything is marks, so everything you see is marks, uh, the little letters here also need to be specified. So these have type uh, text and they have some attributes as well. 
Um, and uh, we can see here that this piece of text is actually listening to a signal. And this is sort of like the reactivity that's uh, tying different pieces together. And this uh, tooltip.amount is uh, uh, sort of, yeah. I'll, I'll walk through sort of how the signals are processed later. Uh, again, as I was alluding to, this feels a little bit verbose for just specifying a bar chart. You can just like, do two clicks on uh, Excel and then you get your bar chart. But uh, the, the Vega team has released with this really good, amazing to use uh, domain specific language called Vega Lite, which, for which you can specify your bar chart up more succinctly. But uh, that's sort of just making sure that we're all on the same page about what Vega does and sort of how it's specifying things so that we can start talking about the architecture. So they, the paper right up front mentioned two very cool ideas. The first thing is a streaming database. Uh, which is amazing. I know database is not sexy, but uh, it should be more. Uh, the second thing is event-driven functional reactive programming. And for those of you who are familiar with this piece of legendary text uh, out of the tar pit, it strikes us as sort of achieving this complexity minimizing approach based on functional programming and relational model of data. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, like I haven't really ran across many uh, languages that actually combine these two. And I think Vega is a pretty good uh, step at uh, hitting this and uh, hopefully we'll get a sense of what it looks like. Um, and since we're at Wikia, I figured that uh, I can do a proof by Wikipedia here. So, um, According to Wikipedia, data flow can also be called stream processing or reactive programming, which explains all the circularity uh, that we sort of get when we hear all these uh, buzzwords. But I, I think underneath the hood, what ties this uh, streaming database and functional reactive programming concepts together is this notion of data-centric programming, which we will hopefully get more into. Uh, with that being said, let's take a look at how Vega digests, the architecture digests each of, each of the components. So first is data, where Vega specifies a name, and then a URL where this data comes from. So in the data flow diagram, this uh, architecture that, the, the diagram that represents the underlying architecture, you have a root which specifies to input, and because we're not doing any filtering, it directly goes to an output. Um, once we introduce a little bit more complex of a data input that takes a source from the one that we just specified uh, earlier and do a filter transform on it, we have this uh, diagram up here. So this is what we had before. We added a derivation node and had a filter component. Cool. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if anything doesn't make sense. Oh, this thing, yeah, because uh, I was lazy and I took it from one of their pictures. So imagine if this thing didn't exist. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good catch. I meant the last one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it goes to parts of uh, another piece. I, I sort of took this graph out of a bigger graph so that I can sort of introduce them one by one, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, so sorry, yeah. The, these two lines are sort of not, should not be here. Okay, uh, so we have our data. Uh, the next thing that we need for a visualization is to construct the scene graph. I'm sort of skipping over the, um, the mark definition for now, but uh, how many of you have heard of scene graph before? Okay, not many. Anyone care to guess what a scene graph means for those of you who don't know already? You probably have heard of it. Go on. Okay. All right. Sorry. I've also heard of it, so I'm going <laughs> to. Okay. So uh, there was one guess about a graph of all the data flow on the page. That's a, I think that's very close, but it's like data flow is a too new of, uh, too posh of a concept for uh, a scene graph, but it, it's a data structure. Uh, that represents a graphical scene. So in an example of a game, like a scene graph could represent uh, a monster, I think. And then you have the body of the monster and the weapon the monster has and people riding on motorcycles. It's sort of hierarchical in the sense that you have like a motorcycle and then two people. 
Um, the same notion applies to visualizations as well. So if we take a look at this uh, simple group bar charts, you have the A group and the B group. Uh, it's essentially deconstructed into like, oh, you have A group, B group, A has rectangles and texts, and there's uh, three rectangles and three texts. And so that's the scene graph for this uh, bar chart. And you, you can imagine like, like generating arbitrary uh, scene graphs for uh, arbitrary visualizations. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence. And so the process that takes to generate the scene graph are twofold. So the first is you traverse the mark specification. So here we have actually a nested uh, mark specification. The, way it's, the reason why it's nested is precisely because of the graph structure we saw. You can have like a bar chart that contains like two different bar charts inside and each individual one could be sliced further. For any of you who have used Tableau, uh, you, you sort of can imagine this dashboard with multiple charts in there. Um, and each of these marks have different attributes, and these attributes need to be uh, to be sort of bound to the properties in order to create this node. And then the here's another example of uh, the mark hierarchy. I can't pronounce. So you have lines, and then for each line, you have uh, all these different nodes. So like all of these like, fancy graphics you see on, on your browser, it's not magic. Every single one of them needs like a very particular specification. Um, so the second step of the scene graph construction is that once you have the properties and you have the attributes, you need to evaluate them. And so specifically what goes, goes on is that you sort of need to figure out if it's visible, like who, what should be layered on top and what's below. And you also need to uh, create one per datum. So, so here for the simple visualization we saw, there's actually uh, 12 of them. All right, so now we get to uh, the more exciting parts. Uh, let's uh, take a look at interactions. Uh, so interactions can essentially be achieved via pattern matching over streams. The way we achieve this is by looking at, so here's your stream uh, of user activities, right? Like all that we're doing is like, you know, clicking, moving, and then like releasing, right? So there's no magic, it's just a bunch of uh, events. And then if we want to pattern match drag on, on this event, that's essentially mouse down, and then a certain number of mouse moves, and then mouse up, right? So this could be described essentially as a finite state machine-esque um, thing where Vega took, the C took inspiration from CSS and created this kind of uh, sort of uh, grammar. But it's, it's like regex pattern matching, finite state machines, very similar. So everyone gets this. It's like more declarative than the, the one that we saw previously, right? So now we just have this uh, uh, one line as opposed to all these uh, state management. I, uh, you mean the previous, sorry. Um, yeah, so this just means like start and end and this is anything in between. So if you think of a state machine, I'll have a diagram later. It's like you enter the state when it's mouse down and then you loop in that state and then you exit the state when it's mouse up. Cool. All right. Um, and so because that the signals are bound actually to the definitions, you have something that's super fancy called a reactive geometry. So like all of your marks have properties and if these properties could be derived from your signals, then everything's reactive, right? It's almost like you have this Excel sheet where if you edited one cell and then the other cell would just magically update. It's, uh, it's all the same. Cool. Um, and so now that we have introduced uh, interactions, the, the natural next step is this notion of a data change. Uh, what happens when data changes in Vega? So first, the, the tuples are flagged as either added, modified, or removed, right? Because for like when you do a filter, you're essentially like either getting rid of uh, more data points or, or adding more data points. And uh, the additional inspection of tuple state is also added. So what I mean by this is that instead of reevaluating everything from scratch, it evaluates it based on the delta. So if I have a sum of something, then I probably don't need to uh, calculate everything from scratch. If you told me that you got rid of five, I can just subtract five from my sum. So that's like another thing that they keep. I'll have a more concrete example later. So yeah, so this uh, data point would have an, uh, nope would have an ID and a, like a flag that says whether it's added, modified, or removed, and then a state which corresponds to this current value, and then there will be like a lot of these tuples. Cool. 
Uh, so with a bunch of changes, we have this thing called a change set. And uh, not, I mean, a change set is just a set of changes. And it consists of like tuples or uh, so new tuples observed. So we can have streaming data that updates. Or we can have new signal values, so interactions. Or we can have just like updates that are sort of intermediary. So there could be like indirect updates that's not directly triggered by interaction, but it's sort of like more downstream. They're all abstracted away into this one data notion of a data set. And so raw data and interaction events are all streaming inputs in a uniform fashion. This is very like clean abstraction that makes a uh, component uh, integration a lot easier. And when you implement, so for the Folks that are implementing Vega, they also don't need to repeat the different interfaces for those uh, different pieces. And lastly, as the change that flows through the graph, operators use it to f perform targeted recomputation. Again, like this is very similar to a uh, like virtual DOM, where you you just like pretend as if uh, you have access to everything, and you just do your computation, and the deltas will be evaluated for you as opposed to imperatively. Uh, so yeah. Very similar ideas. And uh, one thing to note is that they have this notion of a collector. Uh, initially, it took me a while to understand like what this thing is. So uh, we've seen this thing before. It was uh, sort of this little node that was right after filter and before output. Why do we really need a collector here? Like I was very confused why we need like why, why Vega needed a separate data structure. And it turns out that you need a collector when the change that needs in a new like schema. So this sort of makes sense because um, when you're moving data around, like each underlying chart actually needs a different schema for mapping, right? So if you have a circle, you need like the center, the radius, whereas if you have a rectangle, you, you need like a, a width and a height. And so these are all like different schemas and they need to be adjusted on the go. And that's why this is sort of specified here. Just a side note. Um, and this actually like gets a little bit deeper. So later in the talk, I'll, I'll try to propose like a system where we use SQL to do everything, and it turns out that we can't because there's some second-order logic involved as a result of this schema change. So it's uh, like these like little things actually just like come and bite you in very uh, like fundamental ways. Okay. Um, and then now that we have our change set, uh, how do we propagate it through the graph? So it's done by the centralized scheduler because, again, if you're not centralized, you don't really have visibility into what has changed and what hasn't changed, and so you can't really achieve these different optimizations. The second part is that it occurs in topological order, which, again, should probably make, make sense to most of you because um, if you don't update in order, it could be that a dependency you that was that change you didn't really recognize. And that would end in like, inconsistent states in the end. That makes sense to everyone? Cool. Um, and the last piece of uh, executing Vega is uh, restructuring the graph. So you, you might think that at compile time, we can just generate this data flow graph, and then at runtime, things just would propagate, right? Does anyone have any idea why this is not possible? Like, why do we need to reconstruct the data flow graph on the go at runtime? OK, so this is like kind of subtle. So uh, what happens is that, uh, OK, this is just stating what I asked. Um, if we take a look at an example of a facet operator, so who knows what a facet is? It's like group by. Everyone knows what group by is. It's, it's uh, say you have a bunch of years, and I want to sort of, uh, I don't really know how to define group by. Hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at an example later. But for, I assume, the vast majority of you know what a group by is. And so when we do a group by, it's actually not known beforehand, before you actually evaluate it, how many results you're going to see, right? So say if I have like 2000, 2011, 2013, I have three groups. If I have like 2014, I have four. So this is like completely data dependent. And if you do a facet operator on your visualizations, that's essentially creating a dynamic number of nodes, right? So, so it's just like literally not possible to predefine before runtime. Um, and so they have to do this dynamic restructuring business, which is pretty cool. Um, and it has to be done while maintaining a topological order so that when you propagate the dependencies, you wouldn't mess up. Cool. 
So that's a whirlwind tour of how Vega is uh, implemented. If any of you are JavaScript pros, uh, Vega currently is actually implemented by uh, Professor Jeff here, and uh, his code is pretty pristine and uh, sort of difficult to read. But uh, so, so sort of this is what we've looked at. We've looked at the definitions. We This is the, the chart generated by the definition. This is a scene graph, and this is a data flow graph. Cool. Now let's just take a quick example at uh, what Vega could do. So this is a visualization called DimViz. Uh, it was a research project project from a few years ago, I believe. And what it does is that as you drag this country over the, the years, it also moves the other country uh, along the timeline. And the, the two axes is uh, fertility and life expectancy. So you can sort of see a trend here. Anyhow, so this is a pretty fancy visualization. If I ask you how to implement this, you probably couldn't, unless you're a visualization designer, or, or, or like dump like a whole day into uh, implementing this thing. Uh, but you can with Vega, with just a JSON specification. Uh, the, the, the good news is that you can. The bad news is that this is a little bit complicated. But let's uh, take a quick look at uh, sort of the different pieces. And the first is that you have to capture the, the, like the mouse movements. So you have mouse down, mouse move, and mouse up, right? The, the simple pieces that compose of your signals. And then you have to do this distance calculation thing. So maybe you haven't noticed this, but when I was dragging, my mouse wasn't exactly on that circle. And they do this really fancy thing where they actually smooth your movements over, and uh, it sort of matches it with the closest distance. So sort of this is the state of the art visualization implementations. It's like, it's like super smooth and there's a lot going on like, uh, that you're not really aware of. But uh, so there's like some fancy distance calculation. It scores the distance uh, so that it realizes where it should go next. And it has an interpolation function so that your movement is smooth. Because our hand movement is not smooth, right? Clearly, we're inferior to the algorithms. Um, and then there's all these like different derivations that's going on to make sure that you see the correct data movements. and. Um, like just to stay true to like being honest about uh, sort of the limitations of Vega, here's the specification. Uh, but but the good news, the good news is that there is Vega Lite, and uh, again, like Vega Lite is very elegant. Um, cool. All right. So now that we've sort of described how Vega is, is defined and is implemented, let's uh, move on very briefly to talk about its optimizations. The first, uh, so the key point here to take away is that they are tracking state at the tuple level and only propagating modified tuples through the data flow graph. And this is sort of the core to how they're achieving uh, optimal performance. And so like in detail, this looks like the following. Um, you track, the, so they further do an optimization where they only track the revision when ne necessary because, I mean, tracking how things change is pretty expensive, especially if you have like tens of thousands of tuples, which is fairly reasonable if you have like a sc scatter plot with a lot of different unique attributes. Um, so think of these hairball uh, like graph visualizations. They have like a ton of nodes. And then uh, state could be pretty helpful. So as explained earlier, uh, we can have this notion that A is a sum of the stream at time t, and then at time t plus 1, your stream got a new uh, member, which is 5. And so A at time t plus 1 is essentially just uh, your previous A plus 5. Right? Sorry, this is like really simple, just to make it more explicit. Um, cool. So that's a uh, tuple revision tracking. And then there is uh, pruning on necessary recomputation. So essentially, this goes back to the idea that if your global scheduler knows what's going on and what has changed, you don't have to recompute. Think like you know, virtual DOM. You don't have to uh, re-update your DOM element if nothing has changed. But it's a little bit more subtle. And there's two different types. I won't really go into details, besides the fact that this really works. Um, and then the last uh, piece of optimization is inlining sequential operators. Uh, so you guys remember that I mentioned topological sort was needed, right? What, how do you implement a topological, topological sorted uh, execution? Right, exactly. So it's basically like an ordered list or a heap, right? Like even if you use the fancy data structure like a heap, you, your insert is still uh, off 
uh, login, which is like, not good when you have a lot of things. So what they said is that they noticed that many things are sequential, so they can just inline the linear branches as opposed to sort of putting them on a heap. And, and they implement this by having like a pointer to your neighbor so that instead of putting it back to the execution queue, they just like execute it directly via the pointer. Cool. And here's one example of uh, Splum is like very specific visualization type where, as you can guess, like the top right is uh, Vega, reactive Vega, and then I think D3 is somewhere there, and some of the non-reactive Vega implementations they had is also like less performance. Anyhow, so uh, that is, oh, oops, sorry, that is uh, Vega. We will spend sort of the next uh, 20 minutes on my favorite subject and also my uh, topic of research, uh, databases. Uh, okay, cool. And so the original data, sorry, the original Vega paper actually made a lot of references to uh, streaming databases. So we're gonna get started with uh, a streaming database. Uh, for those of you who are like more into semantics, let's just like get it out of the way. Uh, how, how are streams related to traditional data to traditional databases? So I have my relation and I have SQL that like takes a relation and generates another relation, right? Uh, how do I introduce streams? Any ideas? Row deltas. Okay. Deltas is like what do you mean by row deltas? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so with changes, there will be deltas. And how do we know, how do we persist that these things are deltas? Sure, yeah, okay, so. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay, like we don't, okay. Kafka is like a whole new line of uh, research ideas. But, but yeah, precisely as you have said, like we, we want to capture the changes from time to time, right? And if we capture this change transiently, like if you discard the state afterwards, it's hard to discover this change if you want to do a query afterwards, right? Like what if I want to say, get me all of the like drivers from uh, two days ago to three days ago. Like how do you like if you lose that information afterwards, you, you can't really retrieve that information. So essentially the way that you combine a stream to a relation is to, um, sorry, when you go from a stream, stream to a relation, you have to specify your window of time, right? Once you specify your window of time, that just becomes a finite set, right? Like if I say, uh, like time one to time 10, like no, ma no matter what happens down the line, time one to time 10 is not going to change, right? So that sort of automatically becomes this uh, a relation which doesn't change. And then when you want to go from a relation to a stream, you just need to add a timestamp and that sort of becomes this, uh, represents how, th how it has changed. So essentially like uh, we can think of streams as in if you fix them in time and they become a relation. And then like the change is only happening because time moves on. Uh, cool. So that's sort of the streaming semantics. And then uh, this is uh, from a paper defined. I didn't invent it. Uh, so Aurora is one of the streaming systems reference. You can think of a, a streaming database system as, and I took this from the author's slides, is that you have this like giant black box which you, to which you define your queries, and then you have your downstream applications that consume the results of these queries, right? Uh, if we sort of break the black box up a little bit, you can see that these are all composed of little uh, operators. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the relation algebra? Okay, like a good bit. So like um, this is a join where we say, I want to find things in this data stream that actually matches with that data stream. So when you say things like where the names are equal across two different uh, like data sets, that's essentially performing a join. And as you can see, some of these operations are actually shared across the different queries. And that's sort of the key insight of a streaming system is that uh, you can share these uh, operators processing to different downstream consumers. Otherwise, you can sort of just have like the individual one and um, that wouldn't be too uh, interesting for research. Um, and then the next uh, generation uh, after Aurora is uh, Borales. I'm 
Borealis, sorry, okay. I did, I did a search on Wikipedia how to pronounce this, but I forgot. Okay, so they basically introduced this notion of a replay and rewind because they realized after working with, I believe, uh, the financial sector that there would be mistakes in their streams and sometimes they actually want to post uh, post hocly uh, change them before they you reach the downstream consumer. And this actually plays nicely with Vega's need, and that's why Vega referenced, uh, I think, this particular streaming system more heavily, is that if you think of the front end as a receiving, like the UI, literally the screen as receiving the streams, you're not really like, it's not really a stream, you're essentially changing things, right? So like updating that screen is actually more similar to a query rewrite or a rewind than it is to like a, like a set of changes. I mean, you know, there are different ways of saying this. I'll probably regret this like two years down the line, but right now that's, uh, that's what I think is going on. Cool. And so that's uh, the streaming system. And uh, the collector thing that we, we realized was part of the data flow graph is also uh, sort of idea-wise coming from views and synopsis from these uh, streams. So view is a very specific database concept which says that you can, like, you can sort of, uh, how many of you have heard of views? It's essentially the same as queries, right? So, um, and materialized views is essentially saying that I want to cache, the re cache this results because computing is expensive and it doesn't really change that often. And when it does change, the database should update it. Um, cool. And so this is essentially a cache that materializes relations shared among dependent operators. You wouldn't really want to like materialize a view if you're ever, if you're all, if all you want to do is uh, use it once. Cool. And there are, uh, so besides the paper that was referenced uh, in Vega, there's also other very cool streaming systems like uh, Telegraph. It's a, like, if you're interested in this, I highly encourage you to check out literature from this area, not because I'm from Berkeley, but uh, it actually has some pretty cool ideas where it says very insightful sentences like queries and data are duels. Like, isn't that cool? Um, but the idea is basically that traditionally we keep the query, the operators fixed, right? And we flow tuples through the, the operators. But you can also think of the operators flowing through data. So like this, this way that when the data comes in, you can sort of keep it in memory until like all the operators that's dependent on that tuple has like sort of been processed and that way you can throw it away. So there's sort of this duality between like which one you keep keeping state like in memory and uh, which one you sort of like pipe down the stream. Uh, I don't have time to like dive into too much of it, but if you go around and say things like queries and data are duels, I think all your co colleagues are gonna think that you're super cool. All right. Um, and so uh, the, the connection between visualizations and databases don't end uh, here. Like this is sort of what Vega has stated that he drew inspirations from. Let's just take a brief look at some of the other interesting ideas um, that I, I actually find to be quite insightful, but I'm biased. Mm. So the first is uh, D3. Uh, if I told you that there is a connection between D3 and relational algebra, like would you believe me or could you sort of tell me which parts of this actually correspond to a selection and projection joins? Okay, so uh, so like here we have a select all for the sort of the P um, attributes. Sorry, I don't know my terms here. And so this corresponds to a declarative selection of objects on the DOM. And then you have your data mapping, which is essentially a join of your data with the page elements, right? Um, and then you have this enter and exit pattern, which is essentially outer join to model the evolution of a data in the page. And so, yeah, this is the things that entered, this is the inner join, and then the whole thing is the outer join. Cool. All right. If this is not cool enough for you, I think the next piece is going to be pretty cool. So most of you probably know Polar, sorry, Tableau, right? How many of you have used Tableau? Okay, but like here's a, I, I just copied this from their website. Here's a demo of how you would use Tableau. You can basically drag the different columns or attributes to uh, here and then you will just render them by these different um, attributes. And you can like select dynamically there and there will be like default uh, interactions that's provided to you. So it's like pretty sleek, pretty cool. What if I told you that this is the same as, or almost the same as a pivot table? How many of you know what a pivot operation does? 
Okay, most of you, but let's just to be sure. Uh, so I have this table with student ID, the last name, the year of enrollment, the course, the GPA. And now I want to sort of pivot on the course, I think that's what you say, uh, where you have the year of enrollment and then uh, aggregated uh, GPA by the different uh, groups in the course. Everyone see like sort of what's going on? If you don't, there's actually a very cool animation. It's a research done by uh, my advisor's uh, other uh, research group. So here's a visualization. So you realize that these informations weren't interesting. Cool. Voila. Uh, peanuts. Hmm? Do you like the peanuts. Oh, keynotes. No, no, sorry. This is a, this is a, sorry. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's implemented. If you go to this website, they have the source code. It's actually implemented, I think, with D3, but uh, this was a GIF. So cool. And, and so, like, I just wanted to show that animation because it was cool and not because it was actually that tight, but c going back to Tableau, uh, what if I told you that I can just like swap these numbers with visualizations? Because I mean, each of these numbers actually corresponds to a bunch of data, right? Like this was an average across a bunch of numbers. And so I can do a further slicing of these numbers that contributed to this value, maybe by like the student name or by the student year or something. And then you get things like this, which I claim looks a lot like a uh, tableau. Um, but you know, you need some imagination. Um, so how does this actually connect back to what we were saying previously about uh, materialized views? Uh, uh, Polaris, the, the research paper version of Tableau, actually had this diagram where you take your original data, you sort of slice it up, and then you feed that into every cell, right? So imagine these cells are what was uh, shown previously. These are the cells, right? So that's essentially just materializing that view, like doing that slicing and then putting that in there. And so you can imagine that if uh, your underlying data changed, then this kind of uh, charts also have to update. And so let's just quickly talk about what materialized views are doing so, and how they connect to reactive programming. Okay, because otherwise you probably would have been interested. Uh, and so here we have a table with the product ID, the amount uh, that's sold, and then the time. And if I want to do a quick uh, materialized view that uh, groups by the product ID, and I want to get a sum of everything that's sold, and also a count of the items that's, that are sold, I basically get this uh, table, right? Make sense to everyone? I basically just say, oh, these are two ones. I added them together, so that's a, uh... okay, I can't do math. Uh, that was that should have been 38, I think. Sorry. Um, and this will be 10, and there will be two items. And so, okay, I take that back. That was a mistake intentionally there, so that you would catch it. Uh, but uh, so, like, what makes this reactive is that if you add a new entry to this table, right, like insert, uh, this your user of this database will just magically expect this materialized view to update this uh, corresponding entry, right? This is essentially reactivity, right? This is no different from updating your Excel sheets or uh, Rx or anything like that. It's all the same. Okay, cool. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Uh, so yeah, just uh, to demonstrate the example in uh, Excel or, sorry, spreadsheets, um, you have your total that's added from these three numbers, and when you change this number from five to six, you uh, change that from eight to nine. That's a reactivity there for you. And there's like a, a lot of literature on this and they all have very cool names. So there's this paper very well written called uh, Your Mouse is a Database written by Eric Mayer who uh, have helped make uh, RxJS which has like a lot of following and cult following too. Um, cool, so, so these are all like connected ideas that are sort of seen across the board. Uh, uh, some research have taken this idea further to use uh, SQL to directly populate front-end applications. So here you're seeing like an ed edited version of HTML and they define the query directly inline which updates the, the um, 
the HTML elements directly. And so this research was done in 2013, and I don't know nearly enough about Facebook React or GraphQL, but I think that there's like some connection here. Um, cool. So this is sort of taking SQL directly to the clients. Uh, the front, front end. So this is no longer visualizations, but just like applicable to front end in general. And for someone who also does research in uh, data visualization, I tend to think that data viz is sort of like the, the frontier of uh, front end programming just because it's a little bit more complex. Uh, cool. And yeah, it has declarative buzzword. And uh, there's a bunch of research actually on sort of how your interactions with visualizations on the client side actually map to queries. And so we, we see like more evidence of these connections. And uh, this is, and I want to spend the next uh, five minutes wrapping up and to talk about envisioning visualizations on SQL directly. And this is a quick infomercial for uh, research that I'm involved with uh, led by Professor Eugene Wu at uh, Columbia. Um, so I'm clearly biased, so uh, please take this uh, with a grain of salt. And it will only be five minutes, so hopefully we're not violating the principles of papers we love. It's very ni narcissistic to love your own paper. Um, so very briefly, uh, I've already set all the background for sort of how you can potentially make the connection of uh, front-end programming with sort of database updates. Just a very quick quick uh, demonstration. So here is an, like the first chart, and I select some bars, which updates those scatter plots. And so as I'm doing this selection, that's essentially generating a stream of uh, mouse events, right? So mouse down, mouse move, mouse up, we've already described these. And then this stream could be joined with a table with uh, all of the stream semantics that we discussed before. And once you uh, join it with this uh, view one, which can be represented by the X and the Y of the bar. So every row is, is uh, the bar mark, and your X and Y specify the position and the width and height and the color. And so like, I claim that this uh, chart can be represented by a table. And this is joined with a table to get the underlying data. And so once you get the underlying data, maybe it corresponds to like San Francisco or uh, Berkeley or whatever, you take that base data and join it with your original uh, source data. And once you get those information, you take that data back and you do some computation that maps back to the pixel la layer. So you have your like circles, their positions, et cetera, and you render them. And this is essentially treating an interaction as one query. Cool. And so uh, here's a sort of a, uh, example syntax, you don't have to read too much into it, it doesn't look that pretty, but uh, the blue ones are user-defined functions, which are basically database outlets for things that are, aren't quite relational. And uh, So here we use a user-defined function to render these data on the client side, which can't, you can't really do it. I mean, databases are very powerful, but they're not powerful enough to render pixels. Uh, so you still need some like external fu uh, functions. But then this essentially just like takes the sales, the base data, the scales, and then using the scales to map the base data to your pixel data, right? Cool. And uh, some people may say that your DOM is in inherently hierarchical and it's not really relational, so how do you like reconcile that? But it, you can essentially, whoops. Uh, you can essentially sort of think these as like a uh, foreign key or what have you. So it's not really that different, it's expressible. And uh, capturing interactions is very similar to the pattern matching that we've described before. So uh, here's a finite, like this like state machine that I was talking about. So when you have a mouse up, you enter a different state, and then in, inside this state, you just like loop until you mouse down back. And so like after you finish this, uh, like, this like trip to your uh, finite state machine, you get your information that's needed, and you can return these. Uh, these attributes, so that when you want to react to a drag, you can just like get these data. So uh, here's a way of using that selection. So we can have a user-defined function to get a bounding box of the different streams, and then with that bounding box, you can reactively define your points so that you select your points to be red if they fall into that uh, bounding box you've defined earlier, which again like could fit into a query. Uh, there's a paper on this, uh, 
uh, the, I think the slides will be uh, online afterwards as well if you want to sort of dig a little bit deeper. This is uh, pretty quick. But all that is to say you can achieve interactive visualization uh, semantics with uh, some extension to SQL. Uh, there are like issues. So as I mentioned before, this collector thing here actually hides like a pretty dark problem where we face tricky issues, like sometimes we need second order logic to modify the schema. And so it's like dynamic modifications are sort of tricky and we're still working through the details. Um, and at this point, some of you are probably sold. You're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. I've achieved unity of my front end and back end. Some of you are like, why are we doing this? Like, this is so ugly, like SQL. Who wants to code in SQL? People who write SQL code like, gets paid less than me. Um, but uh, the, the reason for this is that we can make use of all the techniques backends have to offer. And there's like a bunch of them. Like I've surveyed some of them, but there's like more. Another thing is that end-to-end uh, -end optimization creates new opportunities. Like if, you, if your backend has more knowledge about what's happening on the client side, you can do a lot more to improve your performance than just like blindly optimizing for the 99 percentile uh, latency, right? Like just a really dumb uh, example is like when you're doing a brush, that may be triggering like a new query to your backend every single pixel. That if you know that you have latency and every not every single one of them will actually be rendered because they're too late, you can sort of just dynamically drop them. And this is a like, very difficult. Like you have to architect very very specific APIs in order to achieve these functionality. But what if you have a more unified system on your client client and your server, and then maybe you can just like you know, push these computation uh, to wherever it is convenient for your optimization. So, so uh, I don't have time to sort of dive into all the details, but uh, I, I do think that there are sufficient motivation for sort of doing this weird thing of uh, bringing your uh, systems to your front end. Um, just to wrap things up, if you take anything uh, away from this talk, I think you should take away the following, is that everything is data and we're seeing more and more proof of this uh, from all of the JavaScript hype that's being generated. And so there's, again, like much more left to be done at the intersection of uh, uh, the front end data flow and back end data flow. And I'm happy to talk more about these ideas. That's what I sort of get paid and spend most of my hours, more than 12 hours a day thinking about. So um, cool, with that, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Wait. Well, but how are you going to answer? Yeah. So. Yeah, I think okay, this cool. is all. Okay, the next one. We can't one up. Uh, so uh, scene graphs can get pretty big in size, um, you know, making them difficult to read and debug. Uh, how does Vega address uh, this problem? So um, I, I think though, so Vega does have like a new tool to debug uh, Vega programs, but I don't think they expose the scene graph directly to the app, like to the visualization developer. I think you might be more thinking about developing games when, uh, sorry. But then the JSON is the scene graph, right? Yes, but it's, it's sort of like a higher level. It's not directly a scene graph because of grammar of graphics. It's sort of, there's like a set of grammars and then these grammars generate scene graphs which generates the data flow, so. Yeah, 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 that's, that's what I meant to say. So the JSON itself can get pretty complex yep. and big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so. Hi hierarchical, hi hierarchically, so how does big address this problem? Uh, I'm probably not too qualified to do justice to the answer, uh, but I would imagine them to say something along the lines of uh, Vega Lite is a much more succinct version of this. And I didn't really spend time describing what it is, but uh, that's one possible answer. And I think the other possible answer is that they've designed a debugging tool that sort of exposes the internal state. I don't believe it's the actual uh, scene graph, but um, sorry, I hope if that's not a satisfactory answer. Yeah. Questions? Questions? 
So can you tell us a little bit more about that pattern matting, matching uh, language? I assume it's it works like a regular expression, so it's Basically, a regular yeah. language. Yeah, it's like a finite state machine. Yeah, I don't think it's like, no one really claims that as a research contribution. I think it's just like an engineering solution. Because, yeah. I mean, it's pretty useful. You know, it's, it's this declarative specification of what otherwise would have been this, this uh, set of variables that get mutated. Yeah, and I think one thing that Vega emphasizes is that they make these uh, interaction modular, right, so that you can reuse them. So you don't have to, like, rewrite a drag for every single interaction. You can just copy that uh, string over. Right, so you, you can compose small exactly. pieces together. Yeah, they'll just all be signals. Everything will be data, right? Cool. Got questions? When you uh, decide to program in JSON, I notice that almost everything's a stream, both the key and the value. When I'm programming, one of the things I really like is um, that when I'm at some point, I can do a dot and I get all the methods. Um, the other thing is I'm dyslexic, so I'm often doing typos and I actually don't like strongly typed languages. Mm -hmm. It seems like with the JSON, you're suddenly doing evals all over the place yep. to call a function. So to me, as a, as a programmer, just a work work person, it looks like a loser to me I, in that in that regard. I, I, I love Jason, but yeah. <laughs> I don't really know how to answer. I, I do have the same uh, issues, um, no, but I'm sure they're working on it. <laughs> How much adoption is there for Vega in the real world uh, versus, let's say, D3? Yeah, so apparently Wikipedia is uh, using Vega for some parts of their websites. And uh, from like, if you extrapolate from the success that D3 has seen, I'm pretty, uh, like, I'm pretty optimistic about Vega's adoption. Uh, I'm sorry if I missed this when you started out, but are there certain times that you would pick Vega versus D3, or is Vega like a replacement for D3, or like kind of where does that fit in? Yeah, again, like I'm hesitant to answer just because I might screw up uh, the proper answer given that I'm not on the Vega team, but I would imagine them to say something along the lines of if you want like really expressive visualizations that are like very different, it might be difficult to make Vega work with it and it might be easier just to like do it imperatively. And so I, I would imagine if you're doing like normal visualization, like generating charts or reports for your company, Vega is probably sufficient when you just need like line, line charts, bar charts, pie charts, whatever. But if you're doing like more complicated things like the, the visualization I've shown to you, it might take a little bit more effort. Um. Any more? Uh, can you comment on uh, uh, Turing completeness and if it somehow factors in with Vega? I feel like the, the, my optimal strategy right now is to shut up and before I see anything wrong. Um, you can answer these questions at the bar. That sounds like a great yeah. idea. Yeah, sorry, I'm just going to punt. I, I can help you cheat. If, if that uh, pattern matching language is regular, then it's not Turing complete. Well. I mean, if you're looking for, like, I guess, like, maybe I could contribute some answer based off uh, your comments is, I mean, SQL's not, like, Turing complete, um, but with certain additions, SQL could be, but I, I mean, I think it's an interesting question, but for people who are working in uh, designing interactive visualizations, I think they care more about, uh, you know, can I, can I get my job done as opposed to can I, you know, theoretically prove that this is a Turing machine complete. No? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.